The Celtic cross tarot spread is one of the most common tarot spreads used today. It's also one of the most complex. Anytime you see like a TV or movie where they've got the tarot cards laid out and someone's doing a reading, they're almost always using the Celtic cross spread just because it's such a classic. Also, if you go to a professional tarot reader to have your cards read about a specific question and you ask for this or they suggest it, it's really likely um, that this spread is one of your options. It is such a classic and it has a really deep history. And I have to say that tarot readers, we can get quite passionate about this spread too. So everyone has their own way of laying out interpreting these cards and people can get pretty opinionated about the right way. But it's all boo boo hooey because you know around here there is no right way, there is no wrong way, there's only your way. So I'm going to show you how the common interpretations of these cards go, but don't think that this is like the one right way. Hi, I'm Angie here at The Simple Tarot, which is all about helping you learn how to read the tarot cards so that you can use them as tools for creativity, self-care, personal development, whatever you'd like, as long as you have fun. So the Celtic cross tarot spread is one of those like traditional tarot spreads, a classic. But when you're starting out, it can be especially overwhelming because there's 10 different cards and those cards can be read in multiple different ways. It's a lot. But of course, like everything else around here, I try to keep things simple. So I put together this short video so you can learn how to read this, the Celtic cross tarot spread, the simple and easy way. Let's get started. So the Celtic cross tarot spread is best used when you have a single specific question or problem that needs deep clarification. So it can also be used for some general information, but that's really difficult for tarot beginners to start with. And honestly, there's better spreads out there for more generalized information. So I highly suggest using this spread with a tarot journal, especially when you're starting out, because it is so complicated, you're going to want to have um, a way to record your thoughts as you go through this. So if you want to play along, grab a deck, a journal, and something to write with, and let's get started. Now that you've got your tarot journal out, I highly suggest writing down your question even before you shuffle the cards. This way, as you go through the reading, you're going to grab on and catch those like subtle jokes the universe is playing for on you. These are the like the be careful what you wish for jokes. Um, they show up all the time in tarot, but it really helps if you record your thoughts first before you encounter the cards. Okay, so like I said, there are so many possibilities with this spread and you're probably gonna find dozens of different interpretations online and that's cool. The flexibility is one of the reasons that this spread is so popular. All versions and all interpretations are acceptable and you can totally even make up your own. But before you lay down the cards, you need to know how you're going to read them because otherwise you start like finagling your cards to the meanings and things get a little muddy. So we don't want that. Just get clear how you're gonna lay out the 10 cards before you even lay those cards down. And here's a special note for reversed cards. You don't need to read them reversed if you don't want to, especially in a Celtic cross spread where there's already so much information, it really helps clarify it or keep it clear if you keep those cards upright, especially when you're a beginner. If you wanna go deeper into your tarot practice, of course, feel free to read them as reversals. They just make things a little bit more complicated. And since this is already a pretty complicated spread, don't feel like you need to do that when you're starting out. Okay, so we're almost ready to lay out your 10 cards. But before we do, I just want to remind you that this is best used for a specific question because the Celtic cross spread deals with the aspects of an issue one at a time. So if you are asking a more general question, just realize that your answers are probably going to be more general too. When you're asking a specific question, you're more likely to get specific answers. So this is called the Celtic cross spread because it sort of resembles a Celtic cross, no duh, with this long stem here, which is usually laid to the right hand side just because we don't have really long narrow tables. But if you're looking um, at this, you can see that most variations of the spread either switch up the meanings of three and five and sometimes cards four and six. So there are also variations on how you interpret cards seven, eight, and nine. So when you go online and you find other versions of the spread, you may find some um, differences, but those differences are almost always between flipping three and five's meanings, flipping four and six meanings, and then in different interpretations on how you um, read seven, eight, and nine. 
You'll also hear talk about a signifier card, which comes from Ed, uh, Arthur Edward, Edward Waite's instructions on how to read this spread. So the significator, which is a totally optional and something I don't actually use at all, it's a card that represents the querent, the person asking the question. So you pull it from the deck before you do the reading. So I never use a signifier. To me, it seems silly since I'm already the one asking the cards and there are already cards on the Celtic cross spread that represent me. Not only that, by pulling one card out of the deck, I have less one less card in the deck that the reading might possibly use. It's totally up to you. Remember, it's your way that matters. Okay, but if you choose to use a significator, you can use the card that most closely represents the querent, the person asking, so in this case, you, um, and it's most often a court card that you're gonna intentionally pull out of the deck, but you place it in the center of the reading before the reading begins. The significator will be covered by the first card of the tarot reading, which is the card number one laid out here. So now we're gonna lay out our cards. So shuffle and lay out and cut your deck just as you normally would. And these cards can either be laid face up or they can be laid face, face down and then flipped as they're being read individually. The nice thing about putting them face down is that the future cards that you're about to read, they're not really complicating your understanding. But the nice thing about laying them face up is you do get to see the big picture all at once. Really, it doesn't matter what you do. Give it a try both ways and see which style you like best. So to begin, lay one card in the center of your table or like slightly to your left. That second card is laid on top of the first, but at 90 degrees crossing it and covering it. The third, fourth, fifth, and sixth cards are laid around this first pair in a circle. So there are different ways to lay out these cards so that you need to try a few variations to see which one really, I don't know, feels like it fits you. So there's really three common placements for these cards. You start at the right of your pair with the three card and place the remaining counterclockwise or clockwise. So place it to your, or you place the third card at the bottom of your pair with the remaining place counterclockwise or clockwise. Or the third way is that you place the three at the bottom, the four at the top, the five at the left, and the six at the right. So my favorite layout is to place the third card at the bottom and the remaining cards clockwise around the pair. And so this is how I'm gonna be interpreting this spread. Really, it doesn't matter, just keep playing around. What you're trying to do is get four cards down in a circle. So the seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th cards are placed in a vertical column to the right of the cross. The seventh card is placed first closest to you and 10th is last at the very top of the car column farthest away. In my interpretation of the spread, card number one represents the querent, which is the person in question. So this means the person asking the question, but in some readings, this may mean someone in the querent's life. And this gets a little bit tricky, especially when the person asking the question is asking a question like, how will my father's surgery play out? Or how will my father's surgery affect our family? There's an obvious second party involved there, so be sure when you're reading the cards to keep that in mind, that the querent card very often is the person asking the question, but sometimes it may relate to someone in the querent's life or the questioner's life. So other interpretations that are common for this card, instead of being just the querent or the person in question, is the heart of the matter. So this is what the, the question or the problem is really about. It could also represent the querent's life at present, like this very present moment, or it could represent what influences the querent. Like I said, there's so many ways to read this spread, right? Just find the way that you're gonna enjoy the most. So card two is the card laying on top of and crossing card one. This represents the situation related to the question that was asked. So this shows the situation, the potential situation or the problem. Like any reading, keep in mind that this may not be referring to the question that is actually being asked. So if it could refer to the question they should have asked instead or that they really wanted to ask but were just a little too embarrassed about, comes up often when you're reading for other people. 
All right, so this card will often show that there are possibilities for a solution, if it's positive, or that there are obstacles in the way, if the card reads negatively. Ch uh, challenges often show up in this position as well. So since this card crosses the first card, you can think of it as the problem that is crossing the querent or standing as an obstacle to their situation. Other interpretations for this second card are what helps or what hinders you. Oh, and just a quick note, um, if you're choosing to read reverse cards, because this is crossed and read horizontally, this is always, always read upright. You never read the reverse, reversal meanings on this card. Okay, going on to card three. This is the one at the bottom of the crosses spread. This card is called the foundation, and this reveals influences on the querent, usually, usually from the distant far past. This card will also show the long-term choices or long-term patterns that have brought the querent to the present situation. So these things are still in, fact, in effect today, even if they happened a really, really long time ago. So this card can indicate negative things that you need to move on from, or positive things that you can draw on for support. Other interpretations for the third card or the card in this lower bottom position is the root cause of the problem or your subconscious influences. Now going to the fourth card, which is the one here on the left, no matter what order you actually laid them down on, this card actually indicates influences that are more recent and have led us to this particular situation or problem, or to the querent asking this question today. Sometimes this card is actually related to the third card, but it does not have to be. They both deal with events in the past. The third card relates to things ha that happened a long time ago. This one ha um, relates to things that happened more recently. And there really are no other interpretations for this fourth card or cards in this position. They always relate to things that uh, happened in the recent past that are influencing the question or the querent. So the fifth card, or the one at the top here of this cross, this card reveals the likely immediate outcome. So this represents the short-term outlook for this problem or situation, generally over the next few months. It's often called the crown card since it's at the top of this cross. If things progress along their present course, this card will show the events that are likely to play, take place in the near future. So other interpretations of this card, the one in this fifth crown position, could be the best possible outcome. It could be what the querent desires as the outcome or the querent's conscious goals and ideals. And now moving on to the sixth card, the final card in our cross, the one to the right. This represents the immediate future of the situation. So the events shown here will be happening quite soon and there is little that the querent can do to change them. So this card shows if the situation is on hold or if it's on its way to a resolution. Whereas the second card shows whether or not there is a solution to the situation, the sixth card shows how far along that problem is to being solved. So other interpretations for the sixth card or the card in this sixth position is whether the situation is on hold or resolving or what the influence this situation will have on the future. And now we're moving to the column part, the seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th cards. So here the seventh card represents the true feelings. This card reveals what the querent really feels about a situation, including how they actually want the situation to resolve. This is a really good card to compare with the first card, the querent card in the center of the cross, to see if there are any obvious conflicts. For example, if the querent seems to want one thing, like reconciling with her husband, but actually secretly she wants something else, like a fling with a coworker, then the subconscious motivations will show up here in the seventh card position. So other interpretations for the seventh card are the querent themselves, how the querent is currently approaching the situation, or advice on how to address the current challenges. This eighth card here represents outside influences. So this card indicates what the querent's friends and family feel about the situation or the problem at hand. It may show that other people are in control or that, that there are people who need to be consulted with the decision making. Other interpretations for this card are the environment around the situation or querent or the people, events, or energy that are outside of the querent's control. And so just so you know, the meanings for the seventh and the eighth cards are really commonly switched. So be sure you know how you're going to be reading them before you start the question of the cards. So the ninth card here 
hopes and fears. This card can closely be related to what is hidden in the eighth card. So the ninth card reveals what the querent hopes and fears about the situation. I should say and or fears. In the example above, your querent may hope and fear that the coworker wants a real relationship instead of just a fling. That can sometimes be a difficult card to interpret, and it really helps to compare it to card three, which is the foundation card. There might be a relationship between what they hope and fear and what has led them to this point. And if this card is reversed, it may be that the querent is not yet aware of how their hopes and fears are driving the situation at hand. So other interpretations for the ninth card are the mindset of the querent, psychological influences on the situation, advice that you should not overlook, or what you need to know about the situation. And now the tenth card, the final outcome. This card shows the likely long-term outcome of this situation if things stay on their present course. This card often shows what happens when you put all nine of the other cards together in a story that addresses the querent's question or problem. And if, there's an, if there is a court card in this position, I always kind of grip my teeth a little bit because it can mean that the ultimate outcome is in the hands of the person who is represented by the card. When you're reading for someone else, there is a natural human tendency to make the outcome seem positive and hopeful, even if the cards are skewing in a different direction. So remember that your role as a tarot reader is to interpret what you see and tell the truth about it, not to sugarcoat the bad news just to make someone else happy. So reading a tarot spread is like telling a story. There is a beginning, a middle, and an end. It is your job to find the thread that runs through it all to bring it together in a way that is positive, actionable, and helpful. So even if the tarot reading is negative, you can always put a positive spin on what they can do to take action regardless of what the tarot spread says. The Celtic Cross Tarot Spread can be complicated, but it is a fantastic spread when you're ready to dive really deep into a problem or situation. I put together this next video for you. It's got common tarot reading mistakes that I see people making all of the time. So you can make sure that you're getting the most out of every reading you're doing and not struggling as you're trying to put all 10 of these cards together. So I will see you right now in that next video. Bye.